and welcome to Jason Waller Unleashed. Real talk, real success. I'm host Jason Waller, former billion dollar business entrepreneur, elite business coach, two-time top five podcast host with the BAM podcast and the True Underdog. You might know me from my TED Talks, best-selling books, or even my brand new reality TV show on Amazon, BAM Fam. Are you hungry for inspiration, wisdom, perhaps a hearty laugh? Get ready for a dynamic, electrifying journey filled with towering business triumphs, intimate family moments, and raw honesty that you won't find anywhere else. Buckle up. This is about to get dope as hell. I'm telling you, I have had all kinds of guests on my previous shows, and we're going to have some bomb guests on this. We're going to be talking about everything from politics to money to business to family to drama to kids to you. You name it, we're going to talk about it. It's going to be real. It's going to be raw. It's going to be in your face. It is Jason Waller Unleashed. Real talk, real success coming now. Bam! Jason Waller here. That's right with Jason Waller Unleashed. I am super excited today to bring uh, to talk to somebody here that not only do we have a friend of a friend that knows each other, but this guy's been running an awesome business. He's had to overcome major adversity, went to prison and fucking bounced back. He's out there on the mainstream writing a book and living the American dream, even though he hit a fucking brick wall. So that's super exciting to hear compared to my story, hitting the brick wall and rebuilding. I've got my man Aaron Singerman here. CEO and founder of Redcon. How you doing, brother? Very good. Thank you for having me, Jason. It's a pleasure to be here and talk to you and uh, talk about our, our similar stories. Different but similar. Thankfully, you didn't have to go through the, the prison stuff, but uh, you definitely went through some stuff of, of your own. I did. It, w- it was tough. And, and you know, we had some lawsuits go out. A lot of them were getting thrown out. and it's tough. But I remember when you were going through some things, we had a mutual friend that was telling me like, hey, you know, this guy built a great business. And, and I, I was watching some of the story on... Um, uh, Savannah Chrisley's podcast, you know, to, I, I'm the type that I don't want to have fixed questions, right? I go in there and I, what I know about you, great. What I don't know about you, I'm going to ask, but I get excited just like the viewers will get excited to know who is this guy. Now, obviously I'm a fan of your product. Uh, it's the, it's the war drink. You know what I'm talking about? Total war, of course. We drink course. the fuck out of that, by the way. So yeah. uh, me and my son love that shit. And my daughter loves the one with it's no caffeine. I got to understand the magic there that you still fucking get high energy without caffeine. Uh, but a big fans of your product. You got a great business out there. But hearing your story of building this company and then hitting a brick wall and going to prison, but getting convicted, I think, in 19 and not going to prison to 2022 is what I'm most interested in, because that whole dynamic of knowing you're going, but still being able to work your business for two years is fucking crazy to me. So talk a little bit about building your company and what your vision was as an entrepreneur, because every entrepreneur has their map, they have their plan, they start to scale, they start to grow, they start to get their wins, they're living in the moment, but they're also pursuing their dreams. And then they got to hit some fucking, oh shits. Tell me what happened. Well, I I definitely did all the typical things that an entrepreneur goes through. Um, I've owned, I've been fortunate enough to own uh, about a dozen uh, s- different levels of success in terms of businesses. Uh, Redcon would certainly be the, the most successful of, of any of the businesses uh, that I've owned, but I've owned uh, quite a few. And uh, I went through all the typical things that entrepreneurs go through. The, the atypical things is like the, what you discussed. So I, got, I left a business called Blackstone Labs, which was my sports supplement company that sold pro hormones and some of your listeners may have an idea about what that is maybe you jason have you heard of those before i have but... not so i'm interested okay, so what is you that? Remember, you remember like barry bonds and like mark mcguire when they're hitting all the home runs and they're taking these supplements yeah. that were legal but they were kind of like steroids right yeah. those were pro hormones those were endosterone which is one of the very initial early pro hormones why well, I, I sold those type of products along with a whole bunch of other products with this company blackstone labs it was a really bodybuilder based uh company it was more for either bodybuilders or somebody who wants to get an edge but don't that doesn't want to break the law right and the law changed in 2014 december 14th 2014 and it was called the designer steroid control act of 2014 and it had not passed three two other times in 2010 and 2012 and then it passed right before christmas break obama signed it into law and in this law 25 substances became anabolic steroids by law. Now these substances were sold at GNC, Vitamin Shop, hundreds and really thousands of retail locations, Amazon before this, but as soon as this law was signed, they became illegal. 
And what we did at Blackstone Labs is we discontinued the, we had six substances that we thought were, were similar. Four of them were on the list and we discontinued them immediately. We sent out letters to the customers. We, uh, all the employees signed a memo saying these were legal. They can't be housed here. You can't have them here. We did a video explaining it. We got a legal opinion from a lawyer said, these are illegal. Don't sell them. The two that are on the list can be added at any time. So don't keep a lot of inventory of them. And we ended up discontinuing selling them in August of 2015 around then. Okay. In that period of time, we, st we stopped uh, selling them around then. Um, we never thought we did anything wrong at the time. Was that I a big part up, of your business? So was that all you guys sold? So that was, was that it was, fucking it was, uh, it was 30 per, 30% of the revenue. Okay. So it that's hurt important a lot. to know for, because that's, you know, how, how, what the impact was when you had to stop selling it. Yeah. So what, what ended up happening was this, Jason. So the, the four products accounted for about, I would say about of the, of the 30%, I would say at least 20%, at least 70% of the 20 of the 30%. Was so there was um, certainly the the reason for us to want to keep the other two if they weren't on the list. Now the government's position and what I ended up pleading, pleading guilty for and saying well, what I did wrong was that we continued to sell those products, the, the the two additional products that were not on the list. Right. Anyway, the government's position eventually years down the road was that that was wrong and that they were illegal, and then that's what we pled guilty for. But. That was in 2014. I left that business and sold my shares in 2016, the beginning of 2016. And I started Redcon in 2016. In 2000, March of 2017, Blackstone Labs was raided by the FDA. And they were looking for those products, but they weren't there because they were discontinued. So my thought was that it was over. We were like, oh, I guess that's nothing's gonna happen. Um, and I hired a criminal attorney who told me like nothing's gonna happen essentially. And then in 2019, we were indicted by the federal government. Uh, by this point, I had been out of Blackstone for three years, and we hadn't sold the products for, for years and years, right? Um, and so I was indicted in 2019, and I just assumed that it, it, would, that it would fizzle out or something, right? I figured right. that, yeah. You know, what was that it. like? Like, you think this shit goes away for, like, a few years. You're like, all right, well, there's nothing there. I've fucking moved on. I'm, I'm, living, I'm living a different life now. I'm running a different business. I've moved on to a different chapter. And then you had no fucking clue. They just randomly, like, here you go. Yeah, so um, uh, like you said, Redcon 1 doesn't make any products like that at all. Right. So we're literally the, the highest standard of, of compliance. We don't make any products that are not that are even remotely risky or whatever. So... Yeah, it definitely is definitely two different lives at Blackstone. I'm not. I don't want to lie and tell people we didn't think we were edgy. We knew we were edgy. We we're right. purposely edgy. Um, There's a fine line, and you and you guys wrote it. I get it. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't want. We never wanted to break the law and go to prison. That's right. for damn sure. But it was it was an edgy company. Black, Blackstone Labs was Redcon One is the polar opposite. I mean, we're sold in Walmart and every military exchange in the entire world. Every Ford operating base. We're sold in CVS, Walgreens. I mean. You know, every everywhere, uh, GNC, VM, vitamin shop, everywhere, right? Yeah. Um, so we're we have to be at this. We have to be kind of vanilla to some degree. We have to be benign. We can't be risky. Um, so yeah, you feel like you know you've moved on. And then I was at of all places, I was at a chiropractor, and uh, my phone was on the counter, and I remember this very well because it kept ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing. And the chiropractor goes, "Man, you were the most popular guy I've ever had in here, man. What what is going on?" Because every time it'd ring, they would stop and ring again, stop and ring again, as he's like adjusting me and doing it. And I just had this bad feeling. I didn't even know what it was, but I was like, something's wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I get a lot of calls, but not that, not where it's like continuous. Right. Um, so when I got out, um, I looked at the phone and I saw that my lawyers, who I hadn't talked to in years at this point, my criminal lawyers called me and I answered the phone and they said, um, bad news, Aaron, you're indicted by the federal government. It's a sealed indictment. You have to turn yourself in tomorrow morning at the federal court at eight in the morning, um, and we'll we'll deal with it then. And uh, it was a shock. It was a super big, big, big shock. Um, and um, and I had to deal with that, you know, with my wife, and it was very scary. And then hearing about the charges, because when they list the charges, they list them out one after another after another. It was eight charges, and it sounds like each one of them, you know, ten years maximum, ten years for this, ten years for this. So it sounded like to my mom and to my wife. At the time, and some of the people that were there, they're like, holy shit, Aaron could go away for the rest of his life for this. Right. You know, um, because they listed off one after another, after another, after another. Um, and when we actually talked to the lawyers, the lawyers said, like, you know, maximally you could look at, you could be looking at 10 years in prison for this. And uh, my wife was shocked. I was shocked. 
And then the then the kind of the really crazy part, honestly, Jason, after that is that there's no finality for years and years later. So this is in 2019, beginning of 2019. So I had all of 19, all of 20, all of 21, and then I went to prison in 2022. So really three plus years of waiting. And that's the three biggest years we ever had of growth in my business. I've never experienced years of growth like that. So it wasn't like I, I slowed down or slipped up in business. In fact, I doubled down. Right. Um, that's when I got a private equity partner. I think you know enough about it to, to say during a time where you're indicted by the federal government, the founder and CEO to be indicted by the federal government, you better have one, sh one hell of a strong company for a private equity fund to come in and go, I'm going to buy in even though the founder and the leader of the business is indicted by the federal government. It's got to be doing pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I, that is shocking, but your business has to be fucking top notch. I mean, A plus, A plus, because it's hard for people to even raise capital. I mean, the due diligence is a fucking nightmare. They go through, it takes forever. So that is like, that's, and one of the biggest things they look at is who the CEO and founder is. Like, what's that? Oh, yeah. So that is huge that you were able to do that after that. I didn't know that happened after that. That's crazy. No, it was big. It was big. Um, it was very big. Our, our mutual friend. But you're owning you know, that. Like, you're not like, how, you're like, look, this is who the fuck I am. This is what I've got. This is how I'm fighting this. But I've got this other business flourishing. And you're right up front with it. I call it like the M&M factor, right? In Eight Mile. When he's like, here's all the shit going on. Yeah. Say something about me you don't know. I'm a big fan of that. Like, when you just put shit out there it's like you know like when i go up and i speak on stage and people like google me like all oh, this guy's a wolf of wall street and fucking you know had this billion dollar company made hundreds of millions of dollars and shit which isn't even true but i just go out there and i say here here's what you're gonna find i had to lay off 2400 people we had you know 40,000 customers got left in the wind and we fucking shut down a billion dollar company I lost 400 million dollars tell me something you don't know about me now like are you get in front of it that's what you did right absolutely well with those guys you have to do that yeah. with uh with with private equity for sure and i a lot a lot of people we talk, talk to a lot of people, and the reason why I talked to them was because um, I wanted, obviously I wanted chips off the table, so I wanted security for my family. I created this great business. It was making, throwing off a lot of money, but ultimately I wanted security for my, my three little boys and my wife. Um, and then the other thing was that I thought to myself, you know, if I have a partner that invests many millions of dollars into the business, if the worst thing happens and I end up having to go to prison, at least I have a partner that's really vested, you know, right. in, the, in the success of the business. So I felt like it was important timing. And I told them all of those things. And I also told them that they're the only reason that I'm doing it. Because one of the things that the, they would say, um, and I'm not just talking about the, the people we went with, yeah. but all the other people we talked to, is they wanted to try to be like, to discount the price based on this stuff, which is understandable. Right. And I told them, listen, the only reason I'm even talking to you is because this is happening. If, if I wasn't happening and I wasn't indicted by the federal government, we wouldn't even be having this conversation because I would borrow money from the bank. I would have a large line of credit. I wouldn't need to do any of this. Right. Um, and um, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, you're, you're right, because um, the business is doing great. So so anyway, yeah, that that level of I had a lot of stress, a lot of factors all at the same time. And the level of just the uncertainty of the whole thing. Um, was really really tough um, mentally. I'm very good at compartmentalizing. Yeah, you know, I would I would say almost to an unhealthy level where people would say like, you know, this guy's just not dealing with things. But I am able to take and compartmentalize stress very well, and I did that all the way till the very end. So the very end, because I had told myself in my head that somehow I would beat it. You know, like I would win. There's no way I'm going to go to prison for this. And I told everybody that. I told my private equity partners and friends and family and everybody, I'm, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. I knew my case. I knew the situation. I knew that, that so it's called mens rea, which is, a, you know, intent. You have to have intent. Yeah. So I was like, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. I'm going to win, right? But at the end of the day, when we were really looking down the barrel of this whole thing and realized that if I went to trial, I would have got, you know, 10 plus years and if I just, if I admitted, you know, that I was, that I was guilty and I said, took blame and I said, well, okay, you know, I should have known better that I would do, I would be two years or less. That's what the lawyers told me, serve two years or less. And at the end of the day, when you have three little boys, two years or less, you're missing some stuff. You're missing some football games, but you're not missing their life. Yeah. Ten years or more, um, you're, you're, you're rolling the dice on, on, on forever ruining your family, hurting your children, you know. Certainly, I wouldn't have come back to a, a business. There would be no red common one right now. Yeah. Um, there would be no, I, I certainly wouldn't have been married. Um, 
Uh, it would have been it would have been um, it would have been the end of the of what the world as I know it. So um, at the end of the day, when I pled guilty, that's when I really fell apart. Uh, like you said, and we talked earlier, and you said you had a few months of being really like dealing with some mental stress after all the stuff went down with with your business. Yeah. For me, that three months or so from the time that I pled guilty, which is actually interesting, I don't. Uh, there's a lot of I have a lot of critical things to say about the Bureau of Prisons and the legal system because I've been through it and I've been yeah. through it as a, as a as a convict, as the lowest of the low, as scum of the earth, right? That's how right. you're treated. Um, and I've also, you know, I've been, I've lived a really great life and a lot of, so I've seen really the, the dynamics and I've seen how prisoners come out of this thing. Most of the time, they don't come out getting picked up by a Rolls Royce in a private jet. Like, you know, that's one in a bazillion. Right. Most of these guys have to figure out life from, from zero. Um, so the, the uncertainty of not knowing what life was going to be like, how it was going to affect my children, telling them, because once I pled guilty, then you know, you're going to prison. Like there's no, there's no two ways about it. You're going to prison. How long you're going to prison, you don't know. Because the judge can do whatever he wants. A federal judge has the uh, ability to say, even if you make a deal and you say you're going to, like the prosecution says, you're going to give you uh, five years. The judge can still give you 10 if he wants. Mm. He can also give you two if he wants also. It's really, it really comes down to the federal judge. They have the, the ability to, to do what they want pretty much. They're like, they're like God in that, in that uh, courtroom. Um, so now you have the element of certainty that you're going to prison. You don't know how long, and you're eventually going to have to tell your children. You're going to have to tell your friends, your family, I'm going to prison. And, uh, and that for me was enough where I couldn't, I could no longer pretend it, everything was going to be okay. Yeah. And, and, uh, and that, that for me, that anxiety and fear manifested in drinking alcohol way too much. Um, I've never been like, um, a big alcohol guy. I had problems with drugs growing up and I made it, I dedicated myself to not doing drugs like hardcore drugs. So I never had a temptation to do drugs, but alcohol was always obviously is much more socially acceptable. So I started drinking as medicine, not cause I was enjoying it, but I would literally wake up with this anxiety in my chest where I'd wake up with like a heaviness yeah, where it was hard to breathe. And I would just drink a little vodka and it would feel like it would recede a little bit. And then a little, you know, a few hours later, it would start to come back where I started feeling this pressure. And then I would drink a little vodka and I'd feel a little better. Um, and, and I did this all day, basically, until, you know, it got to be where I was doing it, you know, all the time. And, uh, and then I had bad repercussions for that. I crashed on my boat. I had a boat that I took out at night, in the middle of the night with two friends of mine, uh, thinking we were going to go out and hang out on Lake Boca. Instead, I ran into a bridge. Thank God nobody got hurt other than me. Um, and it was like three in the morning, so it was okay. And then I, I crashed a car right before I went to prison. Mm. And as a result of crashing the car, um, the, the judge actually put me right into prison. And, and that's kind of why I brought up the, the whole like pleading guilty thing. It sucks. Some guys wouldn't, don't probably wouldn't like this, but the truth is when you plead guilty, you should just go to prison. If you're going to, that has got to be fucking horrible. You, you don't even know what's going to happen. So it was so bad. And, and this is not just me saying every guy that I met, um, that talked about the, the months that proceeded from the, the time that they actually pled guilty to the time that they were sentenced. Some of these guys went to trial, lost, and then got out to get their affairs and orders. And get, so they're getting 10 plus years. So when you're looking down the, the, the barrel of 10 years, I mean, or even, even honestly, even a year or two years, like the, how you're going to behave for the next three or four months, or sometimes guys get five or six months to wait. It's just like your your life is in uh, purgatory, and right. nothing and nothing is going to feel good. Nothing is going to be exciting. You're just it's almost like you're inviting disaster when you give a guy, you know, years in, in prison, and then go yeah, go out there and uh, get your stuff in order and come back and report to prison in a, in a few months. That's ho I couldn't even imagine. I'm sitting here trying to put myself in those shoes, and that's fucking. You're right. You just it's that that dead space time of like. The hell is about to happen tonight. What am I supposed to do between now and then? Because I know that's going to fucking happen. It's like, there's nothing what you, positive about it. You're like, what the fuck? You're going to go to work every day. And then you're like, what am I doing at work? What's the point of this? You go to your kid's baseball game. And I go to the kink games and be like, so this is the last game I'm going to see for however long, you know, and it's hard to enjoy anything, you know? Uh, Why difficult. did it take so long? Three years. COVID. Fucking COVID. COVID. Uh -huh. COVID did a lot of it. Um, there were some delays. Um, we were filing motions and stuff, and it took time for the judge to respond. And then the, 
the defense, or the uh, prosecution would respond, and the judge would respond, et cetera, and so on and so forth. But and then COVID happened, and it pushed it and pushed it and pushed it. Because honestly, my case, I'm a, I'm a nonviolent first time offender. Right. So in terms of like bad guys putting people away, I mean, also my crime didn't have uh, victims, so there weren't. It wasn't like um, people took my uh, pro hormones and everybody died, or there was these bodies or families that were up in arms. There was even in court when, at the end they they were trying to say like victims and nobody came. There was no victims. There was no people to say hey I was hurt or whatever. There was nobody. Right. A victimless crime or very minimally like some of the people said that they got from taking a gynomastia, which is what they call that bitch tits, where if they don't take an anti estrogen, if yeah. you have t- too much testosterone, it can convert to estrogen. So you had stuff like that. Nobody was really hurt. Nobody ended up coming uh, to the thing. And so ultimately, in terms of like fentanyl, all these, I mean, we're in South Florida. So fentanyl. down here, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm literally in the courtroom with, with people uh, importing fentanyl from other countries and, you know, from Mexico and gangbangers and stuff. So in comparison, you know, my case didn't seem very important. Right. Know? Plus it's an FDA. So ultimately, my case is an FDA case, not FBI, not a DEA you know, FDA. But it was the uh, FBI that raided it, correct? FDA. The FBI, FBI was never involved. It. And it took them that, that long to fucking come up with something against you? Yeah, I mean, they, they I think they looked for quite some time. Um, I don't know how it all got going, um, but the FDA doesn't have a lot of resources. They're one of the more poorly funded uh, federal organizations. And uh, they also, FDA generally is civil. It's not, it's not criminal. Um, so it's very unusual to have a criminal F- FDA case. It's not like there's this is happening a lot. In fact, um, for sports supplements, um, this is amongst the worst in history of sports supplements for a, for a case related to a dietary supplement. You know? Yeah. So it sucked. Well, that's that the shit. That's the stuff. shitty news. But we, we, but you've got good news. Like your business is flourishing, right? You get yeah. out. What's that like? Like you're like, fuck this. I got it. First of all, how long did you stay in there? About a year. A, lot, a little over eleven months. What was that like? Um, so the first part was really, really bad, um, um, because the first part I went to a federal detention center, which is like a maximum security prison, um, and so for the first hundred days, I was in. It's called they call it the building, which is FDC Miami. And it's just a, literally a big, tall building, right? Uh, Fourteen floors, and you get um, when you get in there, you uh, if you have um, basically during this time, I have to say the important note is even though COVID was kind of over uh, in twenty January twenty twenty two for most people for prison it was still full blown they were treating it just like it was as serious as ever. So the first thing you have to do is go do quarantine um, for COVID. And so they would put you up in a in this uh, on the thirteenth floor, and uh, I was in G unit, and they would put you in a cell, and you stay in the cell for twenty two hours a day, um, and you get out at different times to use the phone. You have two opportunities to use the phone for seven minutes, in one one every seven, one every hour, and then you have a computer that you can use to send emails home, and then you can walk around the little area, watch TV, or uh, play basketball in the little. Out- it wasn't outdoors, but it was enclosed like at the side of the building um and um and the rest of the time you're in a, you're in a tiny cell with another man you know eight, eight by ten cell with another man with your shitter in there and the worst part of that part was for the first 10 days there was gang violence in beaumont texas uh, where uh two mexican cartel guys killed each other there was really ms-13 and one called black hand they killed each other and so as a result the do i'm not sorry the doj the bop Bureau of Prisons decided to shut down all federal prisons. So for the first 10 days that I was there, um, I was locked down in that cell for 10 days without being able to come out to shower, without being able to get toilet paper, without being able to get toothpaste, toothbrush, Ugh. nothing. So it was, there was no ability to use the phone or use the computer, talk to your family. And uh, it was rough those right. first 10 days especially because it's like you know jason you, you i've achieved uh, a level of success that i have a lot of freedoms in life right so to go from the level of freedom where you know i can basically do whatever i want to do whenever i want to do it to some degree or another um and things i don't want to do i, I kind of almost don't have to do at this point um to going to where you have no freedom of movement you have no choices at all you can't eat what you want you can't go where you want you can't talk to who you want you're stuck in a, in a box with a man you don't know who's taking a shit right next to your face. You know, like literally the toilet is next to the, the beds. And uh, you nobody can take a shower. You can't take a bath. 
you smell like shit, you're using your clothes to wipe yourself up after you use the bathroom. I mean, it is, it, it couldn't go from one more extreme to another more extreme. Jesus. Um, and so, uh, and so, it, you know, your window is like, it's a thin little up bar. So you could look through the pier through the window and see the people down on the street, you know, 12, 13 floors down. And that's it. And there's no entertainment. You know, you, you can't, you can't watch the TV's too far away. And once you're, if you, until you can get the ability to buy a little iPod thing, you can't, you can't hear the TV. Um, so it was, it was, it was, those first hundred days were really rough. Um, but you know, I felt as weird as it sounds, man, I felt relief, um, by the time I was there, because at least I knew what I was looking at. Yeah. Um, when I got sentenced, this is a big, like people who were there, cause I had hundreds of people there for my, for my, uh, when I went when I got sentenced and when I, when I, when I went away, officially went away. Um, and I was in chains. I was, you know, chained up, shackled in a, in a, a jumpsuit, a green jumpsuit. And I came out and when I got sentenced to 54 months, everybody, my mom, all these people were crying, were upset, all my friends. And I, I felt this really weird sense of relief. And I turned around, I gave everybody like the thumbs up, I was chained up, thumbs up like that. And everybody was like, whoa, like, couldn't believe I gave her like that I was a one okay. But the truth was all of that uncertainty, at least I now, I was doing the math in my head. Okay, 54 months, I get a year off for the drug program. I get a year off for the first step program. I get eight months to 12 months in a halfway house. I started thinking about like, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to, 18 months from now, I'm going to be out of here. And now I know at least I'm on the way to being out of here. Right. Versus on the way to fucking who knows what. Mm. Um, so believe it or not, even in those first hundred days, I found a lot of reason to like, feel like hope, you know? Yeah. I never allowed myself to feel desperation. You know, I never, I never cried. I never felt sorry for myself. Um, I didn't allow it. Yeah. I just didn't allow it. I felt like, I feel like I'm one day closer to getting the fuck out of here and being back on the street and all of this shit will make sense eventually. You know, that's crazy. I mean, I'm trying to envision it. I'm just like, Holy fuck. Like, you know, but I could see how that could, that could be a relief. Because the unknown is the unknown. You're looking at your wife, you're looking at your kids, your parents, family, friends, business, and you're like, I don't know what's fucking next. But when you get that answer, I could see that. I could see exactly how that could be the weight is lifted. Because now now you know where you're going. You've got the map in front of you to, to, to get through. Not having a map is fucking horrible. Right. It's like I had no goal. Yeah. You know, if you don't have a goal, how can you make progress? You called it purgatory. That's what it is. You're like, I'm sitting here with the unknown. What the fuck happens next? You People never, like us know. that that are entrepreneurs that are used to manifesting and controlling our destiny by putting in hard work and doing things, that's right. fucking hard because really we have a control problem. We control what we're doing going forward. And when that's no control, it fucking would drive you crazy. I can only imagine. Yeah, it wasn't good. It wasn't good for me. I'll tell you that much, Jason. It was not good for me. Um, but yeah, I did it. And then uh, after the first 100 days, I went to Pensacola, yeah. um, the federal prison camp in Pensacola. And that's where uh, Savannah Chrisley's dad is. Todd is right now. That's how we connected. She reached out to me on Instagram to talk to me about her dad and like what he was going through and yeah. any advice yeah. that I had for her family. And I got very close to her and her, her, her uh, younger brother, who's really into working out. They all go to my gym in Nashville, um, the Ray Cohen gym there. And um, she has a great family. Yeah. Great, great, great family. It's fucked and, up what uh, happened to them. I mean, I don't know all the details, but that I know crazy. all the details. I know all the details, and I can <laughs> certainly say it was fucked up. It's fucked up what happened to them. Listen, there's there's uh, three types of people in prison, and um, and I feel bad for two of them. Uh, one of them belongs deserves to be there. Yeah. Um, I met bad guys there. You know, I met some, especially at, at uh, the detention facility. I met. You know, guys who are legitimately bad dudes where you're like, wow, he, this guy's a bad dude. He needs to be in prison. Um, then there's another group of people that's almost equally as big as that first group based on where I went to the federal, the prison camp. At the camp, this other group of people are nice, good people that just made a mistake. Yeah. You know, um, there's one doctor. I use him as an example a lot. Went to Yale. Um, Yale played football four years. Um was a spinal surgeon and um, he has four little boys and a wife. He owns spinal surgical centers in, in Texas. I don't know if I want to give how much information I give away about the guy, but he in Texas and he's well known and um, him and his wife uh, started the centers together. She kind of ran the books. He was the surgeon in charge and then hired other surgeons to work for him. Very successful guy. I don't know the, 
the exact numbers, but I would say in the realm of you know making around five hundred, I mean, uh, fifty million dollars um, in, in a year doing yeah. these surgical centers. He's making real, real big money. He owned multiple, multiple centers. Well, along the way, he and his wife, or really his wife, unfortunately, billed Medicare incorrectly. They used a code that was wrong um, for some of their surgeries, and over the period of ten years, they billed a million dollars too much. Well, he uh, found out about it um, and changed the code to the correct code, and he didn't self-report because he was scared. Because we told me, I was scared. I was scared. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what would happen. I mean, I didn't know what, the, what was going to be the thing that would, be, that would happen to me, and I'm scared. And he said I was scared that my wife would get in trouble, and so I just we just changed it. We figured it out and five years cool. later, 15 years into the business, there was an audit by the government. Medicare found the mistake and then found that they covered it up. So they, they covered it up. Oh. And um, and he didn't want to lose his his license because this, this is the only thing he's ever done. You know, he would have lost his license. So he decided instead of pleading guilty and getting a year in prison. He ended up fighting it, and his he got ten years in prison, and his wife got eight years. Um, and uh, and and he and he he would tell you the same thing. He's like, I did wrong. Like I I'm, I should have told the truth. I should have changed it, and went and re- self reported, and I give him back the money. And so when he went to trial, he thought that he would, if he gave up some you know give up twenty million dollars, fifty million dollars, pay some penalty, that the that the the jury would understand. And obviously, it didn't work out that way for him. Um, so, but there's a large group of guys that are like this that fucked up. They just fucked up, you know. And, yeah. um, and if you're a nonviolent first time offender, you know, um, there I think that the, the system is really broken for people like that. And and then the other group of people is a group of people that just didn't do it at all. And there's a lot of people that just didn't do it at all that don't have the resources to fight, or they get given a situation where they say the government says, "Hey, you plead guilty and you get a year." Or you go to trial and you get 10 years and good people go, well, what are you going to do? It's math, right? You know, you got to play, so play if you're playing by the, the, the math, 98% of federal criminal trials end in a conviction. So what are you going to do? Are you going to roll the dice on the, those kind of numbers or are you going to take the deal? And there are a lot of people that get scared uh, that take the deal. Um, and they didn't do anything wrong. They're just scared, and they don't know. They don't know what else to handle it. Or they fight. They go and think that they're going to win in court. That's what uh, Savannah's dad, Todd, did, uh, and her mom. Is they they didn't think they did anything wrong, and they wanted to fight it out. And as a result, you know, they got we got hit pretty hard. T- Todd has got ten years in prison for that. You know, that's just crazy. It sounds broken. Yeah. Sounds broken. It just. I think there's look. It doesn't. I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm pretty pretty conservative in nature, and and uh, I do believe there are people that deserve to be in prison, and I think prison should be uh, an available punishment, um, and it is a huge deterrent, I think, for some people. But ultimately, there are some people that go to prison that there are so many other options that could be used. Because ultimately, somebody like me, using myself as an example, I pay a lot of money in taxes every year, right? And I employ a lot of people. And so if, hypothetically, this business didn't continue, they would, the government would lose millions of dollars a year in taxes, and then hundreds of people would lose the ability to be employed, mm-hmm. who also pay taxes. So ultimately, you have to think, like, if, if my risk level, by the way, this is actually the government, gave, gives everybody a, a, a recidivism score. So if, some, if the government says my recidivism score is zero, what is the, I, what is the point of... What is the point of giving somebody a custodial sentence where they take you away from your family and your ability to do business and pay taxes and contribute to society. If the risk score is zero, there should be some kind of other option. Right. In my opinion. In my opinion. So like for Todd, for Todd, let's say Todd did what they said and he got these loans that he shouldn't have qualified for these real estate stuff. If Todd's, I guarantee you his score is zero. If his score is zero, cause he's never had violence because he's married, because he has children, because he owns a home, because he has a ed- college education. There's all these factors. If his score is zero, what is he going to be in doing in prison for 10 years? I just don't get it. I don't know. It sounds broken, man. I, You know, White Boy Rick's a good friend of mine, Rick Worshey Jr. You know his story? Not really, no. <sighs> I've heard his name, though. So um, I met him a couple of years ago. He ended up, being, ended up being like one of my best friends. But I met him. He was going to come on the show. This is probably 2021. 20, no, 2020. It was 2020, and uh, it was right after COVID. 
and uh, someone's like, hey, do you want to meet White Boy Rick? I said, who's White Boy Rick? They're like, watch the movie. I watched the movie, and I was like, holy shit, I got to meet that guy. So oh, we I go, did see that movie. Yeah, so we go, yeah, Ma Matthew McConaughey's his dad. Uh, but the movie's about 60% bullshit. Like, you know, he told me the whole stuff. Uh, he has a documentary out that's about 89, 80 to 90% truthful. They still spun some shit they shouldn't have in there. But we sit down and we have lunch, and it ends up being dinner all the way to, like, midnight drinks. Like, we sit down for, like, eight hours. We just hit it off. And such a great dude. I remember inviting him to my house. We had a party coming up, and I'm like, hey, come over. We're having, like, a Labor Day huge get-together. We had, like, 100 people at the house, and we got a band. And my wife's like, you're inviting Rick. I'm like, fuck yeah, I'm inviting. Dude, I love this guy. So he should, my kids are all like, dude, that's white boy Rick. All, all my I have kids that were in high school, they're all freaking out. He's there, right? But his story is fucked up. I mean, you saw the movie. Like, he literally was a 15-year-old that was selling guns on the street, shotguns at the time. And, and, and then, you know, the FBI and the police have him start selling cocaine. And he does. And then they find out that he's selling it. And, and um, the other guy shoots him out of, uh, you know, uh, the Curry gang. Johnny Curry has him shot. He almost dies. They come and they confront the FBI. The FBI says, oh, we have nothing to do with this. And then he comes out a year later and just starts selling drugs on his own. He's 15, 16 years old, making 800, 900 grand cash in 85 and 86 a month. Right. Driving like all these cars, just crazy and working out deals with with some people out in Columbia coming up through Miami, bringing in truckloads, not knowing what he's doing. Literally 15, 16 years old, does 32 years in prison. They gave him life back then. It was you get life for shit like that. So he had life, never hurt anybody, never raped anybody, never, you know, did any violent crime. But it was a drug crime. And he was a he was a teenager and they gave him life and he spent 32 years in there. And he is not a bitter person. He is not an angry person. He doesn't like he just he just lives his life to the fullest. He's in the cannabis business now, and he has the Eighth Amendment by White Boy Rick Brand that's booming, and he's making money and, and buying a house and has a Lambo and has a place in Miami and does a lot of things. But it's just that's a story where he probably deserved to go, but he didn't deserve to go for thirty two years. No, right? not if you're a kid. Not if you're a lot of the drug crimes we have people that like I, I have a, a guy that was in my workout. We call it a car in the prison, I had a workout car and we'd go get money, which is, you know, get games, work out together. And uh, and he was arrested when he was 18 with uh, marijuana and a gun. And that's a bad, big no-no, but he didn't get in a lot of, he did like a very small sentence. And then when he was 30, he got caught with uh, some small amount of crystal meth, but this is when crystal meth, like 2006, when crystal meth was like the fentanyl of today, right? Yeah. Um, and they gave him uh, 20 years for that. And he served 16, just got out recently. From the time he was 30 to, to 46 oh for goodness. enough crystal meth that would be like, you know, a little something thrown in your hand. Um, but because of the drug laws at the time with crystal meth and because he had the, the prior when he was 18, he just got smacked over the head and got 20 years. Um, so the drug crime stuff is also another one where a lot of these drug crimes look, you know, fentanyl is one that, that like it's hard to argue because you're killing, you're, you're definitely killing people left and right with fentanyl. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of the drug crimes that I have, guys that have done drugs or possessed drugs, the, the, some of the sentences are astronomical. The, the big thing is that these judges have no idea really what they're what they're sentencing to people to. You know, you have no real conception. Uh, and I think, I mean, this will never happen, but I think it would be great if federal judges spend some time, a few days a year, and in the in in prison just to see what it's like. You know, not not like in where the work they're going to get hurt or anything, but like. Go to the Miami in the building and spend two days in a cell or even overnight in a cell so that you see when you're sent sentencing somebody to 10 years of this, yeah. what, it, what you're really doing. Because I'm not saying there's not people that deserve that. Um, I sat in line to, for the medical with a guy in the building who I, I thought was really, seemed like a really nice guy. And uh, usually you don't really ask people, like especially at a place like that, what you're there for. But he asked me because I was still pretty jacked at the time. And he's like, what are you in here for? And so I told him pro hormones and I told him like the story. And I said, well, how about you? And then he said, well, there's this girl, you know, that I work with at the mall. And, you know, she was always looking at me. So I could tell she wanted it. And so uh, we were in the parking lot and I, and I hit her over the head and put her in my trunk. And I was bringing her back to my house to rape her. He's like, and I got pulled over for speed and, and uh, they caught me. And I'm like... Oh, okay. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> not the was, same, dude. Not the fucking same. Oh, I was so shocked. I was so shocked by the story. And he was like, yeah, it's federal because I brought her across state lines. And I'm like, uh, huh? 
And uh, so, like, somebody who thinks that that's okay, like, this fucking guy needs to be locked away for life. You know, he, this is a guy, and he said it so matter-of-factly that, uh, that it, bl- it blew me away. You know, like, that this is, like, just, like... Like it was he, a Tuesday and he ran a red light. Yeah, it was, like, something he definitely had done before, put it to you that way. It was not, it was not, like, uh, it was, like, just, you know, yeah, that's what I... She was looking at me, so I put her in my trunk and brought her back to my house, trying that's to bring her back to my house. fucking crazy. Well, you, you, you get out and your business is flourishing, right? Yeah, well, I, w- I would say that, I would say the truth of the matter is that the, the business was flat. Okay. The business was flat. So um, the, the top line was the same. The revenue was the same. That that for sure, without question, it was it was suffering without le- leadership. Yeah. There was a lot of decisions that were made that I wouldn't have done. Uh, but all in all, my, my team did their very best. They tried their hardest. Um, I left them a, a ship without a rudder, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, um, I, you know, I always knew I was the driving force of the business and everything. But I, I honestly didn't think... Like when I was thought the possibility of me leaving, I didn't think that it would make as big a difference as it did. Uh, and I'm not saying the business was floundering or whatever, but it was it was heading in the wrong direction. And I think that if I was gone for five years or three years, maybe even two and a half years, I don't know if the business would be here anymore. Right. Um, so I don't want to say it was flourishing. I think it's it's now starting to flourish. But it's taken me some time to, to get everything, re- redirect the troops, yeah. get everybody uh, heading back in the right direction. And, um, you know, it's interesting because I, I honestly, you know, when I, even when I did that private equity deal where I was talking about, yeah. I truly believed that I had a leadership team that would be able to carry on if I was gone and it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't miss a beat. And that wasn't true. That wasn't true. No. There's usually you, you, the, the person who creates the business and runs it, that, that's the driver. It's hard to replace that. I mean, that's yeah. why these investors are always smart to want to keep on the driver. That's the main right. reason they want to lock you in and say, hey, you still got to drive this ship because nobody drives it like you. They get it. Right. right? So, um, yeah, I mean, so now the business. OK, so now the business is picking up. Yes. Now the business is picking up. We have so many exciting things that we're doing at this point. Talk now about some of the exciting everything. things you're doing, because listen, I'm, and I'm not blowing smoke up your ass like. I, I love your products. In fact, the right. MRE shakes, um, yes. you know, you, you know, we, we, I remember it was like 2020 or 2021. We were doing, um, you have the blueberry cobbler one. You have all these other shakes yeah. that we were, we were making them and they're just so amazing. And then you've even got some that are dairy free. Yeah. And, well, MRE, uh, MRE, yeah. The MRE shakes are actually uh, beef, chicken, salmon, eggs is the protein yeah. source in MRE, uh, which is one of the products and we have the ready to drink. There's my my cooler right here of all the all the different drinks. I could. Uh, oh, there it is. Show. Yeah. I'm kind of empty right now, but I refill of it. Is that your favorite drink. flavor, of chocolate? Um, I actually like the. It's gone now, but cookies and cream is my favorite one. I like That's the blueberry cool. one. I drink the blueberry one like every day. Ah, very cool. Very cool. So it's kind of empty now, but that's the uh, that's the the fridge. What I are the, the drinks up top? I've never seen those. What are those drinks up top? Can energy? Yeah. Can energy. Yeah. I've never seen that. That's the. This is the 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 big the big play. The big potential is, you know, the the can energy space is a, is a humongous humongous business. Yeah, you I know? won't say the can energy I buy. I won't I won't put them on the podcast. But but I, <laughs> the, but I do buy other stuff. But I do buy your war as pre workout. But I didn't know you had canned energy, and I'm going to have to look at that because there's some cool flavors that myself, my 16 year old who goes to work out all the time, my 13 year old son, I allow him to have a little bit. Um, but, but yeah, he plays football. He's a fucking workout fiend. And, um, yeah, I, I need, I, every day I have to drink a pre-workout and an energy drink and a fucking well, I coffee. I got to send you some then, Jason. You're going to fall in love. This, I mean, this shit's really good. I, I, I'm works. all, I'm all in on that, but I will tell you what, what was impressive with, with the war that my daughter loves the most is it has no caffeine. You're thinking of big noise. That's what it is. Big noise has no caffeine. That's the, that's the, that's the new version. New- it looks like war. Cause I was yeah. buying war a lot and it's like the clear purple one. Yes, that's right. It's she loves noise. that one. Yeah, because it's got uh, it's got focus and nootropics for focus as opposed to caffeine, and then it has all the pump ingredients to get you a better pump and more endurance. Yeah, she takes it. She's like, dude, I could work out like 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 nobody's business. She's like, I don't miss a beat. That's neat. I love it. Yeah. So that's good. Cool. Listen. So so you got some cool things going on there. I've seen. Uh, yeah, we have a mutual friend in Wes Watson. I saw you. He came and visited you. That's mm-hmm. a. Uh, that's a big angry motherfucker. Sometimes I love that guy, but he could be a little big and angry. Yes, he is. He's certainly he's certainly angry. Uh, and he, by the way, he went to a whole different kind of prison than I did. He uh, yeah, went 
real. He went to the real deal warrior warrior school. You know, crazy, crazy, craziness. Yeah, and his story is a little different because he really, you know, he started to build his brand while he was in there. I had him on the show, uh, but he has got a great coaching program now, doing things. I saw you two together, and then. Um, but you're down there in Miami. I'm in Boca Raton, Florida. Of course. So I'm in- Fuck, I'm gonna be in Boca speaking Friday. We should try to get together. What time? When, how well, you if no, no, you got family shit. Like, I'm gonna be there at the Ignite uh, Entrepreneur uh, Ignite thing. I speak at six, but I'm there. Their oh, events start at five. I did a TED talk in Boca. I come in Thursday night with the wife, and I leave Saturday midday. We're gonna be oh, looking at houses down there, so we're talking about moving down there oh, cool. in June. Oh, really cool. Yeah, really cool. Well, I, I'll be here Thursday. I go to uh, Colorado. Uh, for uh, Deion Sanders' game for Friday and Saturday. Okay. But I'll be back uh, Saturday night, which will probably be gone. But I yeah, no, we'll get together. We'll get together. Yeah. Like, I do want to connect. Well, you, got a, you got a house here, you'll, you're going to fall in love. Boca is the best place to raise a family. I love it here. See, I've been torn, and our boy Zach is like, dude, you got to you gotta move here. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, he's got oh, the so great. We're so sick in North Carolina. We lived in Birmingham, Michigan. We loved it, but my wife hated the weather there, and we had a house in Fort Lauderdale for a while, but – I just didn't like Fort Lauderdale. It was too grimy. Yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a huge Boca salesperson. Like, I can't help uh, but but sell it. I mean, it, it's it's just it's a great combination of a lot of things. There's a lot of success and money here, and I personally like being around that because it inspires me. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, growing up in New Orleans, Louisiana, and never really being around that kind of thing, to move here and see it, it made me realize that if all these people can do it, I can do it too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you have the combination of that, a lot of families. There's a lot of families. It, Boca, when I was a kid, my great grandmother lived here, and it was all old Jewish people, like getting ready to die Jewish people. Um, and that was the, what Boca was. And now Boca has become really young and vibrant. There's a lot of culture, there's new restaurants all the time. Obviously, Zach loves the Boca Beach Club, which is unbelievable, a wonderful place to go. Yeah. Not where there's, now there's all kinds of great restaurants, and they have, I mean, they've really done a great job with the place. Wow. Um, and then um, there's just a lot of nice people. And like, so like compared to like Miami and Fort Lauderdale, it's a very different kind of scene. Yeah. So like the, the, they have the same things that we just talked about minus the family stuff in Miami, but it's more like showy, like see what I got kind of thing versus folk is more like normal people who are living a good life. You know? Yeah. I think I'm more that I've already been down the alley of all the Aventadors and the Ferraris and all that. I like that. I've done all that. I don't care about any You'll of that. Still just, see, you're still going to see all that. I know, but it's not a look at me, look at me vibe like right. Miami, right? It's like, this is normal life. And, and that's what I li- like to be around. And you know, the other thing is, is do they got a good football program there? My son plays a shit ton of football. He's a really badass quarterback and I got to get him in a good school to play. That I don't know because my guys are all younger. You know, my oldest is 11 and they're playing my, my youngest now. is 13. So it's like a couple of years apart. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of great schools here. I don't know, like, for the, either, what the private schools versus, like, Boca High, how these schools are in football. I know that the, that the private schools, like, where my kids go to school, it seems like sports are a huge deal. Uh, God knows they always ask for money, uh, for sponsorships, for everything, even though I'm paying a fortune for these kids to go to school. Yeah. Um, but um, How many kids do you school, have? Three little boys. At what are the ages? 11, 8, and 6. Oh, those are great ages. So I've got four kids, 24, 19, 16, and 13. Three girls, one boy. Then I have two grandkids, four and two. Oh, wow. So I'm also supporting my daughter. And, you know, she's getting ready to open up her own business. She's an assistant for me, but she has two kids, and their dad's a piece of shit. So he's never around. And right. then uh, my 19-year-old goes to Bama. So she lives in Bama and comes back. And then my 16-year-old, we're trying to get out of here because there's a lot of coal ash and cancer and stuff. My wife's very like, we got to go, we got to go. So... Uh, my 16 year old doubled down on her classes. She's supposed to be a junior. She'll graduate as a senior. She's trying to go to LSU. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, uh, so she can compete with her sister when they play football and talk shit too. That was the other reason she wanted to go there. That's cool. LSU is a great, great school to go to. I lived in Baton Rouge for, for four years. I was supposed to go to LSU, but instead I became a personal trainer and just focused on the girls and alcohol and all, all the stuff you're not supposed to. So Boca, yeah. you got a gym there, Redcon Gym in Boca? Yeah, Redcon one gym in Boca and then one in Nashville as well. And the Boca gym is tremendous. You'll fall I'll out. have to check that out because I the only gym I've been to in Boca was Lifetime. There couldn't be any more different than, than Lifetime. 
Not that Lifetime's bad. Lifetime's I've always liked bad. Lifetime. I was a Lifetime and, and Equinox member in Michigan. They had one right next to each other. It was a very bougie-ass city in Birmingham. And I loved them. And so when we stayed in Fort Lauderdale, I hated the fucking gyms in Fort Lauderdale. Hated them. So I would drive all the way up to Boca just to go to Lifetime. But I didn't when know you about your gym. When you, when you go to my gym, you'll never look back. Trust me. We don't have we don't have the stuff. We have like we have cool auxiliary stuff like cryo chamber, cold plunge, you know, infrared sauna, those types of things. But it's not. We don't have like a nail salon or. And like I don't a, need any of that shit. I don't need any of that shit. It's a it's it's a combination of hardcore and elegant. So that's what I tell people. It's hardcore elegant. So it has all the coolest equipment. I I personally pick all of the equipment. It's stuff that I've used and loved since I was 13 years old. I refurbish it and I, I collect it like, you know, like you'd be a, a connoisseur of cars or fine wine. I do yeah. that with equipment. So it's the best of the best equipment. I switch stuff out all the time. Yeah. And because I do the gym not for money, but because I love it. I mean, obviously, obviously it's great. It makes money, but I never thought like this is going to pay the bills. Yeah. Um, I switch stuff out a lot and make the gym very, very unique. So. You'll go in there and you'll be you'll be motivated for sure. I might check it out Friday while I'm there since I don't have to go to the thing till five, so I'll have to check it out. You Let guys know. Go, day pass. I will. Listen, I'll uh, I'll I'll shoot you my um in I DM'd you in in uh Instagram so you'll have my cell number. Let's catch up. This is a great story. I'm glad that you came on here and shared this. I think people are gonna be like really interested what's going how did that work, how that went down, um, and just to hear how you bounce back, like how you're living your life now, how you're a great father, you're great you know, husband, you're a great business owner, the business is starting to flourish. You're, you're, it didn't hold you back. I think that's so important in today's world. And I try to tell my kids this and I try to tell people I coach this, that people's Everyone has problems. It's all relative. Everybody has their shit. How you react to your shit is so key. You can either sit and complain and bitch and kick your feet up and whine and make excuses, or you could say, you know what? I'm one day closer to getting this done. I'm one day closer to getting out of this and fucking changing things and, and being better and doing better. And I think that that's so key because, you know, yeah, our stories are different, but they're also similar. Like everything I knew that I was, this was my fourth company I built. I lost everything. $400 million. I goes, holy shit to... Okay, what am I going to do now? For 90 days, I was like fucking just depressed. Like, I don't even know what to do. Now I'm building companies. I'm doing some speaking. We got a reality TV show. Like, it's like, okay, like this doesn't stop your life. It's just a bump. And I think that that's important that people hear your story and they're like, fuck, like, because you, you went into details where I was just, I felt like I was there, like not shitting, not having toilet paper to shit and not showering for a fucking week, smelling some other asshole. And then some guy randomly telling you, yeah, I knocked this fucking girl off in the head and fucking tried to take her to rape, got caught like it's no big deal. Holy shit. But I appreciate you sharing the story. Of course, brother. Of course. It's my, my pleasure. And God knows there's a lot more stories that I got in the book. So I'm, looking I'm excited. What's the book called and when does it come out? It's Raising Redcon and it's coming out in February. Bam. That'll be exciting. Um, All yeah, right. Well, I have got a, uh, maybe you're around January 5th, but I will be in Del Rey or Boca area. We're going to have, um, for our Bam Fam show coming out on Amazon Prime, we're going to have a viewing party down there. So I've got Cindy Meltzer, who's my PR person, setting up a party. Zach's supposed cool. to come. Uh, I think some of the other friends uh, we both mutually know down there will should show up. So let's, let's see if we can get you there. At least you know, we can hang out and get to know each other better and uh, fucking celebrate that. I I appreciate you, man. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. Of course. My All right. Pleasure, Bam.